Greetings once again and welcome. It may be a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you, depending on where you are on the four corners of the world. It's me again, Professor Kodo Namo, your course director, wishing you well as you view and listen to this recording. So far, you have, or you should have gone through the following recordings, the post-COVID-19 carbon transition course overview, module one, Introduction to Global and African Development Agenda Setting and Agendas, Module 2, Disaster Risk Reduction Under Climate Change and Pandemics, Module 3, Low Carbon, Just and Sustainability Transition in an African Context. Today we are on Module 4, our last in this series, and we are focusing on means of implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. Our module outline is as follows. We'll start with the module learning outcomes as usual, module objectives as usual. Then we're going to move on to overview on means of implementation and indicators. We will move to finance, sources, strings and contestations, technology, deployment, development and transfer, education and awareness, capacity development, evaluating net zero readiness in Africa. And lastly, we'll try to consider a few slides from a case study from South Africa's climate finance influence. And as usual, there will be a module completion quiz. You will be given three chances from IDEP's platform where you'll be answering 10 questions. And if you don't do well, you have got a second chance, a third chance as well. Now, what are some of the module outcomes that we've laid for this module? After completing this module, you as my guest or my participant, you should be able to understand modalities of implementing low carbon transition in Africa. You should be able to appreciate opportunities that come with implementing low carbon transitions. You should also be able to grasp the barriers of low carbon transition uh, in terms of the financing that we are talking about and means of implementation. The objectives are as follows, to get a grasp on the means of implementation. Number two, to open up avenues for mobilizing means of implementation towards low carbon and climate resilient African economies. And lastly there, and number three, to build capacity to analyze monitor and evaluate low carbon development pathways and trajectories. Our topics are as follows. We will have an overview on means of implementation and the need for indicators, finance, sources, strings and contestations, technology, education and awareness raising, capacity development, and of course, evaluation of net zero readiness in Africa. Let's now move on to this section dealing with an overview on means of implementation. Business as usual approach to economic recovery in the post COVID-19 period will be harmful for climate change goals. The post COVID-19 period presents opportunities for Africa and its countries to make transitions to low carbon economies. Radical measures like those taken during the COVID-19 pandemic need to be implemented if we are to achieve the desired climate goals and also the net zero outcome we spoke about in the last module, module three. Now, there are eight ingredients for successful transition uh, in terms of means of implementation. Number one, we look at the ability of the process to include all sectors of the economy. Number two, we look at enabling and transformative policies that are dynamic and appropriate for each country's specific situation. Number three, we look at strength of institutions driving the transformation and also the means of implementation. Number four, we look at the availability of a good mix of sustainable financing. Number five, we look at raising awareness on the business case for low carbon transition. Number six, we look at capacity to support desired change or the desired change. Number seven, we look at appropriate technology deployment, development, and transfer. And lastly, number eight, we focus on strengthening 
of big data collection systems to facilitate monitoring and evolution. Remember, I said there is no small data. Now, let's focus a bit on public policy. Public policies provide an enabling environment through which transition to a low carbon economy can be achieved in Africa. Policies that encourage transition to low carbon emissions bring support from different stakeholders. I think there's a general agreement now globally and on the continent that we need to move towards that direction. Public policy further deals with the possible barriers to the low carbon transition change processes. Now, we, there's a need for regulatory instruments or regimes which force behavioral change through legality, which put in place emission reduction standards, which also put in place mechanisms for enforcement, copyright protection, set legally binding emissions reduction targets, and of course, have high level government intervention. There's also a need to focus on economic tools that influence behavior change through pricing, taxes, subsidies, public procurement, direct lending, tradable payments. Now, I want to stop a bit on public procurement. Our governments, our municipalities, our states, they are huge uh, 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 in, in terms of public spending and procurement. So having correct uh, green programming policies sends a good signal towards the net zero. So one of the major challenges we're going to be having, or one of the benefits we have now, is to put in place these public procurement policies and regulations that actually embed the net zero perspectives in them. There's also matters around the role of education in this case. So education, influences behavior change, it also improves awareness. Then it also involves research and development, and it also involves voluntary performance targets. And of course, uh, uh, it requires government interventions. We need to sponsor, we need to finance educational campaigns. Now, as a matter of guide to uh, transition, there's a need for us to conduct a needs assessment to define priorities for low carbon transition. We also need to engage in cooperative governance to establish shared priorities, national, regional, and local. We need to integrate and align low carbon transition with development plans and also budgeting, by the way. So the fiscals should speak to the low carbon transition. So in this generation, if our finance minister or our finance ministers are presenting budgets that don't speak to the low carbon transition, then there is a problem with such a, a, a budget. We also need to mobilize local, regional, and international resources. And of course, we need to build capacities for effective and responsive leadership and monitoring and evaluation. We need to promote ownership and core responsibility for the implementation. In this era, we're talking about shared value. So the shared value is where we co-create this net zero together with all the partners, industry, labor, government, and whoever is involved, we need to have the same narrative. It cannot be a net zero for industry and another net zero for labor, then another net zero for government. Then it becomes problematic when you talk about means of implementation. We also need to participate in development cooperation and peer-to-peer -peer learning. So if there's a country that have done well under implementation, let's go there and learn. Even if there's a municipality that is in opposition, I know the issue of politics is big in, on the African continent because in many instances, the government agenda is almost similar to the political agenda. Officials have always advocated that the government agenda must stand as a government agenda and the political agenda should drive the government agenda. So I'm saying here, when it comes to means of implementation and there is a municipality in an opposition hands, we can still learn from such a municipality. I know there are such scenarios across the continent and I know some of the ruling parties and political affiliations do not want to hear that you can learn from opposition. There are lessons that you can learn, especially 
we are talking about low carbon transition. There's also a need for indicators. Now, when we talk about indicators, I want us just to go back to the SDGs. The world has given us a very good platform in terms of how indicators can be established. So all those indicators, that system can also be a, 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 a useful when it comes to monitoring low carbon transition on the continent. Just as an example, when we're talking about uh, the uh, energy SDG, there are indicators already that are there in the, from the SDGs. And we can adopt some of those indicators to measure our low carbon transition. For example, our access to electricity, uh, percentage of renewable energy, all those things, they are, can be used when we want to measure how far are we going in terms of our net zero or low carbon transition. So we need also uh, to uh, monitor, monitor and evaluate uh, uh, the, the, the low carbon transition. And like I said, this way indicators can be very useful. Now, when you're setting indicators, national indicators are helpful. But at times you also need sub-national indicators or even local indicators on low carbon transition. So one question that comes like, what is it that is to be measured? So we need to measure sectoral adjustments to low carbon technology, impact of low carbon transition on carbon intensive industries, manpower transition to low carbon jobs, penetration rates of new technology, new economic opportunities, all these we need to measure. And then that can give us a very good uh, direction when we are moving towards the low carbon economy. Now, let me talk or move to the section dealing with finance, sources, strings, and contestations. I've already alluded to in uh, module three around some of the challenges we face in financing. As usual, there's an activity that you've set here, a small activity that we want you, it's understanding means of implementation dimensions. What I've done uh, this time, we, it's not a video, but it's a small activity that uh, uh, we want you to do. Often, the default setting when stakeholders consider the subject or the means of implementation is finance and or funding. However, your task in this exercise is to retrieve the 2013 Agenda for Sustainable Development and also the Addis Ababa Action Agenda. And on the list in the discussion forum, other dimensions of means of implementation. So remember I'm saying the default setting is when you talk about means of implementation is financing, but there are actually more other pillars that support means of implementation. So those two documents, Transforming Our World, 23rd Agenda for Sustainable Development, the link is provided. At this Ababa Action Agenda, the link is provided. When you go through them, even just scanning, you should be able to pick other forms of means of implementation. Let's come back to finance. On a global scale, a lot has been done to raise finance for low carbon transitions. However, there are still gaps in funding if countries are to meet emission reduction targets under the Paris Agreement and the net zero trajectory or outcome. The total investment needed for the global energy system to decarbonize rapidly to limit global warming to less than two degrees is up to 61 trillion US dollars. This is actually tripling uh, uh, of 2015 investment levels. Then de development of financial resources need to be done strategically in ways that catalyze the transition to low carbon economy. And of course, there are a number of uh, finances or types of finance that are dedicated to climate financing. So it would be also be interesting for us to dwell a bit on dedicated climate finance. Now, this is funding which usually comes as a grant or a concessional rate. Remember, I spoke about don't go for a loan earlier on. The funding is usually made available by governments, mainly the OECD and the multilateral institutions like the World Bank, IMF, the European Development Bank, African Development Bank, Southern African Development Bank, new uh, BRICS Development Bank, all these banks, they can give you funding. 
This funding is usually channeled through agencies like the GEF, Global Environment Facility, Green Climate Fund, uh, Climate Investment Funds, and other specialized facilities. And of course, dedicated finance, climate finance is managed under its own system of governance and can be programmed to enhance climate impact as a primary goal. Funding can either be multilateral or bilateral, embedded financing economic development deemed to be climate friendly. But funding can also be made available to governments or private companies. However, the funding is usually provided at market or near market rate for high income countries and concessional rates for the low income countries. So we've got a situation where we've got countries like South Africa, possibly Nigeria, that are considered emerging in Kenya, that might have different terms when it comes to climate financing or financing for net zero. Therefore, countries and corporates are forced to venture into local and development pathways uh, if they want to access funds. There are also funds that I wish to highlight from the African Development Bank. And of course, you know that African Development Bank works with other, other, other entities as well. So the African Development Bank has put uh, its own trust funds and also administers external funds. Under its trust funds, the African Development Bank is Sustainable Energy Fund for Africa, which can be accessed. It also has got an Africa Climate Change Fund, and lastly, there it has got a Climate of Africa Special Fund. Then, under the external funds uh, that it helps in implementing, you've got the Green Climate Fund. We also have got the Climate Investment Funds, the Global Environment Facility Funds, and lastly, the Adaptation Fund under the UNFCCC. There is also private capital. This involves climate-related capital injections from private companies and financial institutions. This investment usually comes in the form of loans provided uh, on a commercial risk basis. Financing can be extended to private entities, state-owned enterprises, for example, in South Africa, ESCOM, and also individual projects that might uh, uh, need to mitigate climate change. So here, uh, we also have got issues like the, the uh, uh, green bond, I think, that come into, 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 in, into play. And I know uh, the city of Johannesburg was one of the cities to introduce the, one of the leaders in introducing the, uh, the green bond. So we also have got government spending uh, from our fiscal. So really, we can talk a lot around uh, our, our budgets. So this involves governments making investments or providing budgets for low carbon technology or activities. And I think this uh, speaks well uh, regarding what we call domestic mobilization of financial resources. Example, examples can include investments in rapid transport systems uh, like electric trains or high speed trains that uh, uh, lead to uh, reduced carbon emissions. Then they can also have uh, private uh, public partnerships uh, I know in South Africa, we've got the whole trend that was done uh, uh, just before the World Cup. It was a PPP. Another example would be a parastate or investing in renewable energy sources, such as hydropower, solar, and energy. So I'm saying all those government utilities, they can do that. Then, of course, they also are uh, things that we call financial levers that might need to be looked at. And these financial levers, there are eight of them which include project-based financing, uh, financial sector reform, fiscal reform, uh, fiscal policy, sector policies, trade policies, innovation and technology, carbon markets, and climate intelligence and data. Carbon markets, they were established under the Kyoto Protocol, as you might be aware, and there's still a lot of talk right now as you look at the three uh, uh, negotiation tracks, the UNFCCC, we spoke about that earlier on, the Kyoto Protocol. That is sort of, uh, from my understanding and my reading, in a sort of like an intensive care unit, and of course, the Paris Agreement. Now, we also talk about financial tools. And when you, uh, in investment financing, we've got equity, we've got investment loans, we've got investment grants, guarantees, and intermediate financing. There's also what we call result-based financing, Policy-based financing, trade financing, technical assistance, and of course there is an activity there that will take you less than five minutes. Where we are looking at the climate finance challenge, 
uh, there's a YouTube video there. There's, there's one video that's talking about the climate uh, finance challenge. There's another one that is talking about finance uh, in a post-COVID uh, green recovery, uh, also less than five minutes. You should take time to look at these uh, clips and enjoy them like we did. There are also contestations when we're talking about finance. Some sectors like steel and cement, they lack strategic plans to tackle low carbon transition, but financier, uh, uh, but financier, uh, finance, financiers are no longer eager to fund them. So what I'm saying there is, like I mentioned when the uh, first round was saying, we're no longer going to finance coal-fired power plants or new coal-fired power plants. There are also interests that are facing the same, especially those that are in uh, carbon intensive sectors, cement production and steel. So we are saying that as we speak, financing, monitoring and evaluation, what do we do about this? There are also possible premature depreciation or stranded of assets uh, uh, and assets that are stranded, we spoke about that. Then of course, there are constraints in the reallocation of the workforce from shrinking uh, sectors. Now, low carbon transition as part of the contestations can threaten the stability of financial institutions as well. You can imagine if uh, uh, most of the banks, like I said, they were financing carbon intensive sectors. They now need zero comes, and there must be also a transformation in the funding financing sector. So therefore, government could lose taxes and other revenue from these businesses that are plunging. So there is actually a big risk in terms of, of, of uh, climate financing, because if you're talking about the fiscals, they need to generate revenue from taxes. Um, and of course, income tax, pay as UN, corporate tax, and other forms of taxes, green taxes or levies, carbon levies. But when these industries are going down because we are going or moving towards a low carbon transition, or they are also transitioning to low carbon and net zero, there's also a huge chance that the uh, money is going to be, uh, uh, the, the flows into government coffers are going to be reduced. I also want to raise a, a financing red flag. In your notes, you are going to see the a, a map uh, that we did on, on red uh, projects, uh, the World Bank Forest Carbon Partnership Facility. This is one of the facilities that um, invest in, in, in red projects, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation projects. But in that uh, slide we are saying, the risk that we face is while we are talking about net zero and low carbon transition, we see this uh, uh, repartitioning of the continent through funding. So that uh, uh, World Bank Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, it just tricks countries that are along the equator. Why? Because that's where the bank can get the highest returns in terms of red projects. So, as we transition to this net zero and low carbon transition as a continent, we need to be aware of this because there are going to be issues where uh, the divide and rule can be applied and that will leave the continent not in such a good shape because we are moving towards uh, net zero. There's also going to be issues around the stick and carrots where countries that don't do much, maybe the, the conditional funding can be withheld and we will be pressured through that. And it will be nice if as a continent we can work together because we can easily reach net zero with the resources we have, the forest we have, the renewable energy we have. So basically uh, the African continent should be one that actually should approach and uh, reach net zero first, given the resources we have. But this can only be done provided we have come together to do that. Now there's also debates around technology, de de development, deployment, and transfer. Now, there is widespread deployment uh, of uh, or mass scaling and transfer of low carbon technologies. This remains critical. Uh, transferring low carbon technologies can be seen as a process of collaboration. It can also be seen as a process of learning and adaptation. And effective low carbon transition, uh, technology transition, it needs to take place. And of course, there's something that we've learned from the from the, the pandemic and the vaccines, whereby there has been a lot of vaccine nationalism and it has shown us how technology transfer can be so contested, contagious, 
and so difficult. So we are saying as we move towards uh, net zero 2050, uh, uh, the African continent as a whole need to negotiate good deals in terms of technology transfer. And of course, we can use that uh, staircase of technology transfer. You'll see it in your PowerPoints. We're talking about indigenous interventions. If you've got local technologies, let's use them. We can collaborate. We can uh, do imitation. We can do diffusion. We can do adoption. So all these things are necessary when you're going to move towards a low uh, carbon transition. Then you also see other issues that in terms of deployment, there's the this, uh, what I call the uh, uh, the yoke of intellectual property rights. I call it a yoke because it's a heavy yoke on the African continent where we are not allowed to, um, to, to scale and replicate part of the technology. I think this way, President Ramaphosa and the, uh, our Indian president they have been uh, trying to, to negotiate in global platform in the WTO. In terms of some of the wavering of these intellectual property rights, especially in terms of pandemics and others. So I'm also saying here, yeah, we need to still continue negotiating for good deals in terms of technology. But we also need to be very careful. There's what I call technology dumping or low carbon transition technology dumping or low carbon dumping. By low carbon dumping, what I imply is there could be a solar panel somewhere could be in China, it could be in, in Germany, it could be in the US, it could be wherever, a, an exporting country. And that panel could be of a first generation, second generation, third generation, or fourth generation nature. I know with our uh, gadgets, be it computers or cell phones, we know of these generations or tablets. So what I mean is, when you're talking about low carbon transition, we need the latest technology, low carbon technology on the market. So we don't want a situation where we end up with a continent filled of Japanese, cheap Japanese cars or any other technology, a buy one, buy one, get one free concept. So as a continent, this is something that we need to, to safeguard against. Otherwise we end up with the low carbon technology that we don't need. Come a few years down the line, we need them to replace that technology and we would have wasted money. So in summary, I'm saying we have got a duty. Our, our, our intellectual property offices, our standard bureaus, they have a duty to monitor the technology that is going to be deployed on the continent as we move towards a low carbon transition. There also is around capacity. And of course, there are, uh, I'll speak about five capacity uh, influencing uh, tra uh, uh, technology transfer. So capacities that influence technology transfer include human resources, physical, financial, institutional, and organizational. And we need also to address these things as we talk about technology transfer. You will find more explanation in your uh, in your uh, PowerPoints that are loaded on the platform. Now, there are also issues around the techno climate technology centers and networks that have been established. So we discovered that they have been, um, uh, uh, this uh, climate technology center, uh, climate technology center and network has been established during COP16. And it, former, it was formally launched during COP19 in 2013, uh, but established during COP16 uh, in 2010. And of course, uh, it has got an operation arm of the technology mechanism. It aims to promote the acceleration of low carbon technology transfer at the request of developing countries. Then of course, it also provides country specific technology solutions, capacity building and advice. We need to actually hook into the system and assist. I also spoke about the GEF earlier on, a global um, uh, environment facility. Jeff was established in 1991 and formally launched in 1992 during the Rio summit. Broadly, it is aimed at tackling environmental challenges, but low carbon technology transfer is also a cross-cutting theme uh, in, 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 in the Jeff. 
We also have with the Green Climate Fund that was established during COP16 in 2010. And of course, we are scaling up this uh, mechanism. I think although generally we're saying uh, uh, um, uh, Green Climate Fund uh, with its roots in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, during Copenhagen 2009, then I think uh, as we move uh, towards other COPs, then that mechanism must refined. But the roots, like I said earlier, one module one, it was during the uh, Copenhagen summit. There's a 4.20 minute uh, clip that gives us further details on the Green Climate Fund. You should enjoy it like I did when I was preparing this material. Then we also have got the United Nations Technology Bank for least developed countries. And since it's operationalization, the Technology Bank has conducted comprehensive technology needs assessments in Guinea, the Gambia, and Uganda. And these needs assessments were meant to support demand-driven formulation of national science, technology, and innovation priorities for national development strategies. So we can actually use that facility. Now, there are also a number of actors that are involved in driving low carbon technology development on the continent, donor-driven, social-driven, firm-driven, and policy-driven. You can read this uh, on your own in our series. So, like I said, we need definitely to be on the lookout or on the watch out for technology dumping. And this is an issue that I want us to always remember. I'm going to move on to education and awareness again. So basically, the transition to low carbon economy will be difficult to achieve without adequate education and awareness raising. So this awareness raising and education must actually go to the classroom. It should go to the lowest level. It should also go to our houses because this is a collective decision. And if people are not aware, then that is not going to work. Low carbon and sustainability transition education is one of the cheapest strategies to a sustainable future. I can substitute that and say it's one of the cheapest strategies to net zero by 2050. So education and awareness raising empower especially women and men to adopt sustainable lifestyles. Education that is packaged to change behavior and preferences towards low carbon transition is key to unlocking successful transition. Therefore, when we're talking about education and awareness raising, we also include participation, we include knowledge generation, we include changing of attitudes and as well as building the skills. So there is actually from the United Nations Framework on Regional Climate Change, Article 6 and Article 12 of the, so Article 6 of the UNFCCC and Article 12 of the Paris Agreement unanimously encourage education, training, providing information and raising awareness of the public about climate change. Therefore, these are actually issues that are embedded in global uh, uh, platforms uh, or documents that are aimed at changing behavior. Therefore, when you are talking about education and awareness, packaging education for behavior change in communities in, is important. So what do you do? That packaging needs to uncover barriers to the desired behavior in the target group. That program will be wide scale and continue to evaluate. So we also uh, need to do that in our youth, uh, packaging education for our youth, uh, low carbon uh, transition education for our youth. We can use role models. Who are some of our role models? I know there are soccer play players that are known we have got guys like uh, Sadio Man from uh, Senegal, who is also doing a lot in his community, by the way. I like that player, not because he played for Liverpool, it's not my team, but because of what he's doing. There's also another player, same team, uh, Mo Salah. There are other players that we know, African players, we can use as role models. We can use uh, 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 other uh, uh, people in the arts and film industry that are known characters, they can lead us. And we can even use our presidents that we know they are champions in the low carbon transition. We can use them too. So we also need to link with everyday experiences. We can use social media. I know the young ones like social media. 
So as we are raising is around low carbon transition, net zero by 2050, we can actually create a youth platform for net zero by 2050. Uh, 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 we can engage in discussion forums. We can also participate in clubs and other uh, issues that are, are linked to that. Now, there are other issues as well that we might want to, 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 to look at uh, as, as, as uh, we continue with this evaluating evaluation of net zero readiness in Africa. It's important. Now, the concept of readiness is one that I've uh, uh, written about also widely. And what is interesting there is if we are not ready, we may not make it in terms of net zero. So globally, there has been an increase in countries, cities, and regions that have, uh, that have set net zero carbon emissions. In addition, more than 1,000 major companies and over 30 large investment groups managing over 5 trillion US dollars have also committed to net zero emissions. This brings us to the core question, is Africa ready for transitioning to net zero emissions and monitoring, reporting, and verifying those emissions. Now, for Africa to be ready, there are certain minimum readiness conditions that need to be met. I have put here about six of them, uh, 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 the readiness pillars, so I call them. You can read them as uh, some more on your own. So we need high level political buy-in and commitment and championing if we're going to be ready for net zero. We need our institutional setup and capacity development to be in place. We need financing to be in place. We need low carbon policy, including legislation to be deployed or developed. We need research and development, technology and innovation, as well as direct property rights to be set up, right? We need programs and projects in place. For us to scale up, we need to see them. Or some that have already been scaled up, we can learn. And of course, uh, on an overarching uh, side, we need networks and partnerships in place as well. Now, as of February 2020, 50 out of the 54 African countries had ratified the Paris Agreement. This is a huge achievement, and I'm sure maybe the numbers have gone up by now. However, despite most African countries ratifying the Paris Agreement, there are serious concerns about their capacity to deliver on their commitments. So far, Africa has been largely left out of the picture with few countries having roadmaps to achieving net zero emissions. So if your country, I think this is also going to be part of an interesting homework for you. Because in your last assignment, which is uh, for the uh, last week, you are supposed to be uh, dealing with NDCs and also other policies. So we are saying there so far, uh, we, there are few countries that have done that. So only South Africa has set or sort out, set out a solid net zero ambition and roadmap. And given limited financing, very few countries will have any incentive to fall through. So sub saharan Africa currently produces less than 4% of global emissions or Africa as a well. whole. And some view net zero policies as having limited relevance compared to poverty alleviation and job creation. So you see, this is quite an issue around readiness. So, so what about net zero? We are concerned about poverty. But the truth of the matter is the net zero pathway is going to cut across poverty lines as well. If we are going to remain stationary, we might end up experiencing more poverty. This is what we don't want. So we are saying, that let's rather be part of this bandwagon because it's not a bad, bad bandwagon. It's almost like the SDGs. They are not for a particular country. They are for everybody. So given limited financing, very few countries will have an incentive to view net zero emission policies as a priority. And we are saying, from this course, we need to be aware that our politicians might not prioritize net zero. But it's now our responsibility to present the business case for net zero on the African continent. So as such, I'm also saying we also need to uh, develop uh, monitoring, review, and verification mechanism. And as a continent, uh, as the continent comes to terms with the fast approaching net zero commitments globally, 
we need to put in place our own monitoring, reporting, and verification system in place. We aim propose, therefore, from this actually recording and series or course, work to start towards the development of an African net zero tracker platform. Now, this is not there. Uh, it's just my ambition that maybe after this course, we can put our heads together, IDEP and other agencies, to develop our own African net zero tracker platform. And it also assists us in seeing the progress that is being made. We cannot have somebody that was developing that platform for us. I want to repeat, we need an African net zero tracker platform. And I will be happy to lead in that initiative if resources are available and to develop that particular platform. On this platform, the net zero, the African net zero platform, we will be uploading or upload and track issues such as policies, which net zero policies have been put in place, financing, what funds are available or are coming out, which projects, who are our champions. We can also feature testimonies from businesses, testimonies from labor, testimonies from governments in terms of their net zero. So I think this is our to do uh, issue activity after the course to say, let's put our hands together and create this proposal that I've put on the table, African Net Zero Checker. I know we've got Africa Development Bank, we've got other agencies, UNECA, we've got ECOWAS, we've got SADAC, we've got uh, EAC, all these uh, regional uh, blocks, we can actually put our hands together to put in place this African Net Zero Checker. Now, as I'm going to be concluding this module, I'll just quickly run through a case study on South Africa's climate and renewable energy finance inflows. Um, so what is interesting, there, there are a number of inflows that are coming uh, to uh, South Africa. And um, I won't be able to go through all of them. But one thing that is clear, the country is ready uh, uh, going into net zero. And some of these uh, uh, um, finances uh, where they are coming uh, to, they are getting into sectors such as agriculture, food systems and food security. They're getting into health. They're getting into low carbon, climate resilient transport systems. They're getting into energy efficiency and energy demand system management. They're getting into land biodiversity and uh, ecosystems, renewable energy, carbon capture and storage. They're getting into disaster risk reduction and management, low carbon climate resilient spatial development, waste management, they're also getting into social protection systems in the public works program. And lastly, they're getting into water conservation and water management. You see these things in your, in your, in your uh, uh, PowerPoint. These are the strategic result areas for that. Now, part of the funds there, for example, World Bank Green Energy Technology Fund gave ESCOM uh, um, uh, uh, about uh, 250 million to build 100 megawatt uh, capacity in Uppington uh, concentrated solar power plant. And of course, um, there's also funds that came from the, uh, so, uh, sorry, World Bank gave 200 million, uh, CTF gave 250 million, African Development Bank gave 64 million. All these are uh, US dollars to ESCOM. Then there's also development of utility scale wind power plant by ESCOM in there and they've also other funds that have come in, CFT 100 million, World Bank 50 million and African Development Bank 35.6 million. These are issues that are coming up. There's also South Africa Sustainable Energy Acceleration Program, which see uh, climate uh, uh, technology fund is given 77.5 million US dollars and things are happening there. Then under that uh, uh, Sustainable Energy Acceleration Program, Solar PV received 42.5 million from African Development Bank. And also there's a solar PV that received 42.5 million from International Finance Corporation. So these are some of the funds that are being channeled uh, to, to South Africa. Bilateral finance that have come. Germany, for example, under Energy Efficiency Program, Public uh, Building Program, uh, 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 sponsored 4.7 uh, million euro running 2017 to 2021. There's also a climate support program, phase two, uh, with worth 16 million euro. Then a uh, government of the Flanders gave, uh, there's a third country support strategy 
uh, 25 million euro that has given to South Africa. Norway, Environment Cooperation Program Capacity Development within the South African National Inventory. It gave um, uh, 4 million uh, Norwegian dollars. And of course, the US uh, leads has given 15 million in a program that was running 2015 to 2020. And also interesting thing uh, for South Africa in terms of readiness, South Africa has put in place its solar uh, potential map or Atlas. It's available done in 2015. There's also a wind potential Atlas done again in 2015 by the Department of Energy is in place. There's also small hydro potential done in 2015 by the Department of Energy. It is in place. So what we are saying there is, when we're talking about readiness, there are also things that need to be done before investment comes. So when somebody comes to South Africa, they want to invest in solar, they know exactly where to go. Uppington is our solar hub, but any other place in the country is also as good. Northwest, uh, Northwest province is good, and other provinces, they're also good on solar. If you want to get wind, you know where we are wind still and where we have got potential in the country. If you want to go small hydro, you will know exactly where you need to invest. So I'm talking about this because these are all necessary readiness issues that need to be in place before we can go on Kilimanjaro and say, come and invest in our country for renewable energy. So South Africa has done a good thing, a good job in having these maps or atlases ready. And I'm imploring that other African countries should do likewise in terms of readiness. I hope you have enjoyed this module, our closing module uh, in a series of four modules. And uh, I hope you've also gained some knowledge, some skills. And as you read uh, other supporting materials, the PowerPoint, the module notes, and other recommended readings, you will be able to increase your knowledge. And of course, you should be able to attend to your quiz. Uh, with those three opportunities out of 10 questions that will be given at a time. And as your course director and uh, IDEP, plus other stakeholders that are financing this course, we want to thank you because without you, we are not there. As the popular saying says in Ubuntu, you are, I am because you are. I wish you well. Uh, also, as you are going to be preparing your last assignment in week five, uh, it's an assignment that we've uh, set uh, uh, surrounding the nationally determined contributions, which will enhance your understanding uh, as we move towards net zero by 2050. I thank you. <laughs>